So I'm going to start with the bike itself because I got a lot of this stuff already bolted in. Um, as I said before, I 3D printed a battery tray that kind of fits inside this uh, old chopper oil tank. And it's holding the battery. Again, this is a kick only bike. This is not an electric start. And so I was able to use a really small battery. I mean, you can see the thing is tiny. It is a, what is it, AutoZone or Advanced Auto Special, uh, but the ETZ7S. And, and you'll find like they'll come in some other numbers or nomenclature. It's all good. They're all about the same. Um, should be plenty for running kick only. And then on the side, on the lid, there you see that terminal block. So this is the terminal block. It's just metal to metal, right? So it allows me to hook a wire up to one side and loop, 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 and then separate out each side. It's just a splitter. Um, here is the uh, circuit breaker we talked about. That's right next to it. So positive terminal on the, on the battery here will come into the circuit breaker and then out to the terminal block and then the wires will dive down through these clever little holes that I put in the lid into the inner side of the cavity of that 3D printed tray for the fuses and all that good stuff. But uh, negative post will come back to the frame. Uh, the frame came to me this way with uh, speed holes drilled already in it. Uh, there is some primer still on the metal here, so I'll grind some of this down, get a nice metal-to-metal -metal contact, and probably do the, the ground either here or more likely from the underside so you see it less and so that the seat doesn't rest on so many bolt heads or, or the actual connector. So uh, that's already in the bike, and I selfishly just didn't want to take it out also already on the bike for the coils so some of this stuff isn't necessarily like wiring it's more like the hardware or, or like the pieces and, and and parts of the bike that you're connecting uh, but these are the coils that i was talking about these are the 1.5 ohm uh, dyna tech coils specifically for running dual coils because your wireman what is it, parallel or series? I always forget. Put them in the comments down below to get it up to three ohms, um, which is where they recommend for this application, this bike with this charging, with that ignition. That's what they said to run. So uh, who am I to say otherwise? Back here is the key switch. So this came on the bike. You can buy these separately. I'm always a big fan of um, electric start bikes being, uh, what is it, like a four position switch where it's spring loaded so you actually start the bike there as opposed to a separate push button. But hey, you do what you do. In this case, it, it came on the bike so I'm just going to leave it and run it. This is the high beam toggle that I mentioned. So this has a little jewel in the end of it that lights up. I used it on the iron head. It worked out pretty well and looked kind of spiffy um, with blue lighting up when the high beam was on. Uh, this bike already had this kind of galvanized metal <laughs> uh, plate on the side so I'm just gonna run it don't care gonna leave it grungy but that's my high beam switch right underneath my thigh just to hit high beams there so that's already on the bike also already on the bike I mentioned it before so you have your alternator your, your rotor and stator on the side of these bikes the alternator bikes and that wires from this plug always make sure this plug is really push down on there good um, making good contact because that goes to your regulator this is a regulator most bikes are going to have them in this front general vicinity these harleys are pretty no, you know pretty common to have them here sometimes you'll see a custom bike with it mounted like in the middle but a uh, pretty basic regulator and out of that regulator comes one wire that goes to the charging system we talked about that on the wiring diagram video on this side inside the cone will be your ignition. So on most of these bikes, it'll either be a points ignition or uh, in this case, a Dyna style ignition, a Dyna S style ignition. Not sure why my phone won't focus today, so just bear with me guys. And out of this is coming a wire whip that was previously on the bike. And if you see, it's got white and blue, just like we said. So this will go all the way over to those dual coils and wire up for the dual coils. I think that's about it for the electronics already on the bike. Ooh, no, that's not true. I lied. So down here, you can just see it, the yellow feed coming in. Right there is the rear brake light switch on this bike. This is like a, a block 
and then on the other side it's like a round housing you can see it barely that's the rear brake light switch it's got a wire coming out of it i just got to rewire to it uh, that's the rear brake light switch that lights up when you stomp on the rear brake and then what else was i going to show you oh so on these bikes you can just see it tucked under these crusty oil lines that little housing right there oh come on focus there we go that little housing metal piece there has a tab on the end of it or like a cylinder sticking out the end of it uh, harley sells a little uh, fitting a little terminal that goes on that for the neutral switch that's the neutral switch on the top of the transmission i'll show you the actual terminal in just a sec and then last but not least uh, i won't be able to sh oh here we go so i'm gonna go like this down in here this is the oil pump on the back of the engine uh, one of these holes, I honestly forget which one, I think it's this one, maybe this one, is the hole where you're supposed to put the oil pressure switch. I'll show you that in just one sec. The bike doesn't have one on it currently, i got to add one, um, but that's also in the works. Okay, now let's go check out the stuff. So, first things first, before the actual gear, uh, tools and supplies. Um, I am a huge fan of, of being frugal. Uh, not cheap, but frugal. So I buy stuff at Harbor Freight. And truth is, um, it hasn't done me wrong yet. So shrink tube. Big fan of shrink tube. I like these little uh, short piece kits just for flexibility. Some of them are really big. Probably bigger than I ever need. Uh, but it's sometimes good to just have a variety of sizes. And then just a standard Harbor Freight uh, heat gun. It's two settings, low and high. I like the low setting. You can run it on high. Make the shrink tube shrink even faster. Um, somewhere around here I have a whole other roll of shrink tube in addition to just these pieces. Um, just to have on hand. It's, it's really, to me it's really important. Like anytime you see stuff like this, this kind of drives me nuts. Because it'd be so easy to put shrink tube on this before you put this terminal on. Pull the shrink tube on up over top of this red all the way right to here and shrink tube the whole thing. It's going to be another layer of protection to make sure that this terminal doesn't yank off. Now, I say that because this. I'm probably going to get a lot of flack from this from the Internet Cowboys. But I don't solder all my connections. Um, take it for what it's worth. It's a lot of work to solder. You can solder every single connection. I have a soldering kit down there. I might do some of them. Um, I've not done it in the past, and so far I haven't had any problems with it. If you make a good crimped connection using good crimping tools, and especially if you're putting shrink tube over top of them, in my opinion, um, soldering is not, not a necessity. Um, I forgot to grab these. There's that package of shrink tube that I said I always had. Quarter inch by eight foot black shrink tubing. And again, if you go to Harbor Freight, you're going to see all kinds of these things on the shelf in all different diameters and shapes and sizes. They are cheap by a bunch of them because they're just good to have. And then get yourself a nice pair of wire crimpers, wire stripper, wire crimpers. Also a very inexpensive tool, but make sure you got a good pair of um, can't say that enough. And then of course, I mean, the ultimate wiring accessory. Zip ties. So, uh, that's the tools side. So let's talk about some of this, some of this other stuff in this little box of wonders. So, first things first, if you're doing electrical, you need wire. I bought this wire two bikes ago. I still haven't run out, as you can see. There's a ton of it. Just go on Amazon Prime or eBay, look up multicolored wire and get yourself a nice a nice assortment. I mean you can you can geek out a little bit and get like seven different colors or eight different colors, whatever you want. Uh, this is 16 gauge wire. I run 16 gauge for almost everything on the bike. We'll talk about that in a sec, but all the uh, Accessory circuits, all the wire that goes to the coil and ignition circuits, that's all 16 gauge on what I'm doing. And so far, it hasn't hurt me. Um, I do, however, 
run 12 gauge for the charging circuit. Why? I, honestly, kind of like rule of thumb or old wives tale or reading stuff on the internet. Remember how I said in the last video, if you watched it, do your homework, do your research. Don't just watch my videos, but go watch everybody else's. Go watch Tetro and Mike's Garage. Hello, welcome to Mike's Garage. Uh, go watch those dudes because they're a wealth of information. And it seems like out of uh, out of most of those, the charging circuit going from either your generator back to your circuit breaker and battery or your alternator regulator back to your battery, uh, beef it up a little bit. Let that let that puppy eat. Um, go 12 gauge and get the oil off your hand from touching your grungy bike. So that's the wire. Um, and if you noticed on the plans, on the wiring diagram, I do have, come on, focus. You're going to be a jerk, huh? There we go. I do have red going from the regulator up to the switch and you can see I even do red from the battery to the circuit breaker and red through the key switch to the terminal just to keep that little bit of extra capacity going to the terminal and then I go to 16 gauge beyond that so 12 gauge for the charging circuit and 12 gauge through the key switch to the terminal block and then I neck down to 16 gauge that's that's wire here's the uh, Inline fuses that I talked about. Again, auto parts store. Just go buy yourself a bunch of them. They're cheap. And while you're at it, let's see here. Just digging through my pile of stuff. So fuses. Inline bayonet style fuses. Easy stuff. Um, easy way to get a fuse. You, you can do the inline twist in cylindrical fuses, um, but depending on which ones you get, I think some of those are still glass these days. Uh, these plastic ones are kind of hard to go wrong with. Easy to replace in a pinch. In addition to that, um, I kind of nerd out every now and then and just buy a ton of terminal ends. Yellow, red, and blue are the different gauge sizes. And you got straight to straight connectors. I like the eyelets. If you notice, like I'll actually go and buy the two different size eyelets because sometimes you're in a really, really tight spot trying to get a, a terminal to fit on a small screw that's up against something else and you need these small guys. If you got the space, run a big one. Why not? It's going to last longer. Harder to break. Uh, and then sometimes you just need the bayonet style to slide in to some place maybe you don't have access to remove a screw to get it on uh, i was actually flush out of terminals when i did this shopping trip so i just kind of went a little crazy and got like three of everything um, you can buy these in big kits the the hardware store i was at had a sale going on so i kind of stocked up never hurts to have a lot of these terminals and again when i do these terminals if i do it the way i like doing it You'll never ever see these colors because it'll all be covered up by shrink tube. So then there's a special terminal. It's like some, some, some stuff you just can't get at the local hardware store. So this is your classic V-Twin manufacturing neutral switch female type. Now they only come in like a 70 pack. Not really 70, but what is it? Like a 10 pack, a 5 pack? It's a crimp on connector on the black end and then this end here fits down over top of that cylinder stud that's sticking out of the neutral switch on the top of the transmission that I showed you earlier so I only need one of these uh, so if somebody wants to buy four of these off me I'll, uh, I'll give you a good deal got more terminal ends ah circuit breaker so I did buy two of these circuit breakers. I bought one at 30 amps and one at 20 amps. I think I'm going to run the 20 amp because I don't have a starter. Um, I have not done the math and calculations on how many amps, all the wires and all that. So one of you guys in the comments, I'm sure, will uh, let me know that a 20 amp is overkill or underkill. This is a 30 amp version, and you can see, like, this is what it'll look like on the shelf at 
O'Reilly or Advance. Um, just look for one of these circuit breakers. Very, very simple. Very, very simple. For the record, just in case it's not clear, the difference between a circuit breaker and a fuse. A fuse is a one-time use. When it blows, it blows and it's not repairable. That little ziggy zaggy piece in the middle will actually pop um, when the current gets too much to handle. Uh, it'll, it'll pop itself. At that point, that fuse is junk and garbage and you need, you need to put a new fuse in. But before you put a new fuse in, go figure out why the fuse blew in the first place. Circuit breaker will reset itself. Um, so kind of like a, a, a circuit breaker in your house, that's a switch where it actually clunks on and off. These circuit breakers are self-resetting. So if something happens wrong in the electrical system, there's a short or an overcurrent somewhere, it'll trip inside here and it'll shut down everything that it's connected to. But leave it alone for a few minutes, uh, disconnect it, reconnect it, it'll reset itself. Um, Again, the first bike I had had that problem. Uh, there was some sort of electrical problem, and the whole bike was wired through one breaker, electric start and all. And it kept tripping the circuit breaker, and it was so frustrating because I didn't, at that time, know what I was doing, didn't know how to wire. Um, and I would just let the bike sit for a while. I'd twiddle my thumbs, drink a sweet tea, come back to it later, and start it back up and hope that it would fire up. And sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Um, circuit breakers will reset, but here's the deal. Don't be like me. If your circuit breaker trips, go figure out why it's tripping. Go figure out what's shorting. Use a test light. Use testing techniques. Look at your wiring diagram. Figure out why it's tripping. Don't just replace it. Don't just wait. Go figure out the problem. Speaking of test lights, um, test lights and test wires. So this is like cheap stuff, but like to me, super valuable. Uh, so basic test light, if you're not familiar with how this works, um, you have two ends. You have a, usually there's a alligator clip end and a pointy pointy end. If you connect these to a positive and negative terminal of the battery, and it doesn't matter in which direction, if the battery is good, this guy will light up. And that's how you can tell that the actual circuit is good. Um, so if you clamp this onto a frame, for instance, the frame should be fully grounded, right? and hook this to anything that should have juice, whether it's positive hot or switched hot, it should light up. Now, if it only kind of sort of lights up, that tells you that you have a, a semi-bad ground somewhere. If it lights up nice and bright, then you know you got a good connection. That's a really valuable piece of kit right there. Um, they're cheap, Harbor Freight. The wire is super thin. Uh, this is one case where you maybe want to spend a couple bucks and get a nicer one, because this wire is so thin, it frays and breaks pretty easy. This alligator clip comes off pretty easy. This is like the third one I've had. Of course, in, it's the third one I've had, but it's been like seven years. So that's not a bad average. But then also, um, buy some of these alligator clips. And you all might know these as a different type of clip, and that's fine. No, no judgment. Uh, buy some of these clips, crimp them onto a 12 or a 16 gauge wire, uh, shrink tube the ends, um, and just have them laying around. These are super handy. If if you're doing bike work, you're doing coil work or spark plug work, that's one thing. But if you're doing electrical work or lighting or circuits, it's just handy to be able to clip this onto the frame one spot real quick and clip this over here because inevitably you're going to be using this test light and it's not going to be long enough. The wire is not going to be long enough. You're going to be really upset. It's good to have at least one, if not two, um, different sets and anytime you have some spare wire just save the spare wire you're you're going to want it you're going to need it eventually uh, make yourself some jumper cables there basically more wire if you really want to bougie out you can get yourself some cloth covered wire this is from lowbrow customs shout out lowbrow 16 gauge cloth covered wire so it does the same job as this other color stuff but this is meant to be exposed so i'm going to be running this stuff uh, basically from that rear brake light switch. I'll wrap it around the frame rail there. I'll wrap it around the sissy bar. I might actually go to the other side of the bike and up. I'm not sure. The chain is over there. Uh, this has the brake hose already kind of roughly in that location, so I don't want to get too cluttered on this side of the bike. We'll see. But this is going to be exposed. Two wires, a low beam hot, so to speak, and then another wire for a high beam hot coming to the rear brake light. And as you can see, just like I said in the wiring diagram video, we got, we got three wires here, ground, low, and high. 
and you can test these. Like as soon as I bought these, as soon as I got them from Amazon, probably come from China somewhere. As soon as I got them, I dropped them on one of these spare batteries just to, first of all, make sure they work. And second of all, to make sure how they function. Because much like the switches, some of these taillights, very rarely, but sometimes I've seen one um, where, yeah, you have ground, that's fine. But to actually make it light bright, um, it's one or the other. So like one is low, but then to get it to light up hot for high, you have to do just power to the other one. It all depends on how the little LED circuit board is in these lights. This one, when I got it, I tested it out a couple different ways and determined that uh, this one is more normal based at least from what I've seen where hot in one is low, hot in both is high. Hot in both is what's needed to run this guy for brake. So when I test out the rear brake light switch, then, then you know that you're actually getting stuff wired correctly. Test it first. Don't wire up the whole bike and then just hope that it's right based on somebody's wiring diagram on Google Images. Test this junk out with some spare batteries or even the real battery, but test it all out on your bench first using jumper cables, leads, test lights. Figure all that stuff out first before you go and build your bike because you might find something. And if you do find something different from what you thought, you can update your handy dandy wiring diagram. So here's, here's some more China stuff. These are the little idiot lights. I bought this pack a long time ago when I was actually just starting fabrication on the uh, the Irish Monkey, which was my former uh, built well people's champ build that stalled once I moved to North Carolina. I uh, haven't really worked on it much to the dismay of my heart, but I bought these little idiot lights when I was working on that bike and I'll buy them again because um, these are actually pretty cool. I like them because they have a metal uh, ring metal ring and they come with a little rubber washer so i've gotten these before some of the idiot lights i tried to buy for the iron head project were plastic rings and plastic stuff in here and when you try and tighten it down and crank it down it, it just broke or snapped or twisted these are actually pretty nice so when you're buying these if you buy them on amazon or ebay make sure you're looking for something that has metal nuts <laughs> metal nuts and uh rubber washers to to sink in there what I did um, on this bike, you can just barely see them right here and here. Let me see if I can focus. I took the headlight bucket apart, located them where I want, made sure that they had clearance on the inside, that these weren't going to hit the actual headlight housing on the inside. Found my spots, drilled the holes, mounted them in, the nuts go on the inside. So it's just super clean. But these little suckers being LED are super bright. So I'm, when I'm in the riding position, I'll be able to see them right up there. If anything goes wrong, I'll be able to see right away. And if I hit neutral, uh, I'll be able to see right away. What else we got here? So here's another switch. When I bought this switch, it was a two-pack. So this is the high beam toggle. You can see there's ground on the left. And then there's battery and high beam. And again, when you're buying these, make sure it's the metal housing threads coming with metal uh, nuts and washers. It's I've, I've made the mistake of buying some that looked good, but they ended up being plastic. And that might work for a dashboard on a truck, but on a rattle and vibrating Harley, um, you want good metal stuff. That's all the parts and pieces, yo. Um, that's the tools that I use to do it. I used this same setup, the same tool, same rig when I built the iron head that I did the three videos on before. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing here. So next up is the process of actually starting to wire the bike. Um, again, I, I started this video series to try to be more of like, okay, you just bought a bike and now you're going to rewire it. How are you going to go about it? What are you going to do? And I, I noticed something that I didn't mention in the very first video. When you first get a bike and start tearing it down, don't take all the wire out. Um, you see, I actually left this stuff in here. Now, this is the old stuff that came with the bike, and you can see partially why the uh, bike was having some electrical issues. Eh? Um, rough stuff here, uh, really, really sharp grinding spot here from previous owners. Um, 
I'm leaving this in here because what I'll do is use this as a pull string. Like I know these wires here go down the seat, down the seat post and under, and I'll actually use these. I'll tape them off. I'll, I'll heal up this little boo-boo right here. I'll tape new wire or I'll tape new pull wire in to be able to pull it down through the seat post and fish wire through the frame. Um, obviously that's good for the seat post. It's good for the backbone. There are no current wires coming down the front leg, so I'll have to fish those through. I'll show you that in a separate video, how I do that. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to mention that too, because don't, don't just rip everything out because some of the wires that are in your bike right now, even if you're replacing them, might be handy for you to be able to install new wires. So stay tuned. Uh, I'll probably do a uh, next up video for starting the wiring process and show you that basically spoiler alert uh, first step up is to run primary wire through the frame with really long whips hanging out everywhere i'm not worried about final connections basically what i want to do is load the frame and load the battery tray with the quantity of wire and the distances of wire that make sense leaving probably about a foot extra at each location so i'll run all the wires up to the headlight and then leave an extra foot of wire for each color wire that I need in this location and just let it dangle. Get the primary wiring done. So that'll probably be the next video up. Stay tuned for that. If you have any ideas, comments, thoughts, suggestions on what you'd like to see, what you'd like to see different, uh, leave them in the comments section below. Or as always, feel free to hit me up by email at bpeak82 at gmail.com. Or you can check me out on Instagram. The Instagram handle is at bpeak82 for the bike work or at 82 engraving company all one word 82 engraving company for some engraving stuff that i might show you in another video cheers